Is anyone else having that issue? For example, this week I prepared for the discussion and all the readings from parables because that's what it showed me to do. And then in another class, I also am behind because of the same kind of uh, an issue in homiletics. So does it, is anyone else having that issue? And sorry that I have not read the proper items no. for today. No, no problem. I was just kind of alluding to that, Kyle. Yeah. I was I was musing out loud about the fact that um, we are technically on the week of gender, but we haven't had time because we didn't have that first class uh, okay. for the first week. So we haven't had because I wasn't at the opening session, you know, in Danville. So that that's what happened. So um, it's not your fault at all. You you're you're perfectly right. And what I was musing out loud was that um, we would we would cover what you've been reading, namely ideas about the Holy Spirit, for example, and parables, sort of the themes of that week. We, we're going to cover that somehow along the line, along the way, along the way. Um, not maybe, I guess now what we'll do is just join that week, the next week. We'll join the next week on gender. And um, don't worry, don't worry about the about the readings for the discussion. We'll, we'll just actually, we'll, we'll do an explanation as much as we can. Um, okay. Because uh, Darlene and Bob have posted on it and so on. So yeah, so, so, that's, that's, so that's what we'll do. Great. But, so I don't think you're out of sync. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And by the next week, we should all be in the same place. Okay. I, I find it difficult to look at everything on my laptop while I'm talking on Zoom. Um, <laughs> Well, let me see if I can just see something. No, I can't see anything. So I'll just confirm that in writing. So, yeah, so don't worry, Kyle. Okay, um, let me start off with some of your observations, uh, the people who were able to post in the forum. So I'm not sure if you had a chance to look at each other's posts, uh, but they were, they were good posts. And, um, Maybe I can um, maybe I can ask you if you would like to bring up anything that you posted. We're talking about gender now. No, we're talking about yeah the post you made on gender. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, let me let me then let, let me then ask this. Supposing that somebody asked you why you would look at the topic of gender in Luke's gospel, what what might you say? Because after all, we could look at it with John or Matthew or Mark and so on. But why why Luke? Probably because Luke pays more attention to it. And how would you define it? Well, the, the, the gender issue, particularly as it relates to women. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's any question that the others pay a lot of attention to um, men. Right. But uh, Luke seems to have more to say either about or to women. Right. Right. So then we're talking about the whole notion in modern scholarship that gender is constructed. Gender is constructed. Biology is not destiny, as Simone de Beauvoir said in the second sex a long time ago. Uh, but if we take the notion that both masculinity and femininity are constructed and performed, this is to follow Judith Butler, who is a, a very erudite and um, uh, scholar that's difficult to read on this topic. Um, we can say that we can say that um, uh, Luke helps us in understanding a little bit about the way gender is perceived in the ancient world and in modern scholarship. And when I say gender, I mean also masculinity. I don't know if you had a chance to look at the Botswana essay, not not mm -hmm. Kyle, but the Botswana essay is a very interesting essay. Um, what did you make of it? I, I thought it was uh, um, strange that there was no connection drawn between um, 
the male tendency toward violence and uh, that sort of thing based on a biblical uh, construct or, well, what I'm getting at is the absence of character that goes with that. Um, and character is not really mentioned in that article as, as to why uh, you take these stories either out of context or misunderstood uh, or misread and justify some or any kind of violent activity or um, oppression or any of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about um, Kevin or Darlene? Well, I was struck by the, uh, well, I, being an anthropology major, um, I knew about these patristic societies before, and the fact that they just take over women's lives mm -hmm. and can even execute them if, you know, like the lady in um, the Samaritan woman that Jesus talked to mm -hmm. for Sunday, um, mm -hmm. you know, she was given a writ of divorce five times and who knows why mm -hmm. but even that they could kill her for burning her husband's dinner mm -hmm. i mean that is <laughs> to our society that is ridiculous mm -hmm. uh, but you know i can see in my um, own life that my mother was on the farm mm -hmm. my grandmother was on the farm she worked in the fields and did all that and then had to come in and cook dinner and you know it was just to me you know that that's just not right <laughs> somehow right um, right right so um let's see so uh, let, let's see uh, do you see anything different in luke darling um toward the end of luke um he's kind of neutral uh, men and women are speaking right um, but uh, also the names of the early women start mm -hmm. to fade mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and i was thinking and i even posted this that this could have been the beginning of a male priesthood in the church mm -hmm. uh, all the councils are men mostly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um yeah, even the Roman Curia is all men, so women have very little to say. Right, 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 right. I, I don't know if women have very little to say, but that they're just not listened to, they're not taken right. seriously. Right. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, when we go back to the, um, uh, the discovery of the empty tomb, and the women come back and they tell what they've seen, and the men kind of just discount it. They really just don't. Uh, they're don't, not believed. Yeah, they're not believed. I mean, actually, uh, uh, you know, specifically, I think. Um, also, I think you know, women weren't believable as uh, as uh, as the uh, as people to testify in trials and those yes. types of things as well. You know, so so specifically, I think it's a status that uh, that maybe is not one that you could equate women with being property, but you also could equate women with being in a status that wasn't much above that of children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. So Kevin, just like you said then, doesn't that make the gospel narr or the resurrection narratives important then? The, the initial, uh, Deirdre, doesn't that help us when, when, he, when Christ appears first to the women? Um, I, I think so. I mean, actually, you know, we, we see it time and time again where, uh, where Christ appears or God calls the uh, uh, the least likely uh, of uh, of individuals. I mean, basically, it's not the people in power or the people that uh, would be readily believed, but but it's oftentimes the people that uh, that really have a low status within society. Uh, almost as though I think I, uh, I have an architect friend who um, who says that when she designs a building, if she designs it to take to take care of of, uh, of the least of uh, of people that are going to actually use the building, then everything else takes care of itself. That, uh, that specifically, you know, you don't have to now have to consider uh, uh, someone who may not be in a, in a position of a, a status of privilege, because if you've taken care of the least, then everything else falls into place. Can you just clarify the people who will use the building? So the, the ones who are less significant? 
Well, actually, I, met, I, I was thinking that, that uh, and she uh, talked about this in, in, in reference to things like uh, handicap status, that if you build a building that, uh, that is handicap accessible, uh, and then you take care of, you think about all of those things like access and accessibility, uh, then it takes care of everyone else as well. Yes, I get that. I get that. Dr. Good, the, uh, I found interesting the, the, the final saying from the Gospel of Thomas, right. where Peter objects to Mary Magdalene being one of them. Right. And Jesus says, he will make her a man mm -hmm. and therefore equal to all the rest. Right, right. Yes, um, this requires a longer discussion, uh, but, but you're right. I mean, the, the face value of that text is exactly what you're saying. Um, and the verb here in Coptic and in Greek is to become strong, i.e. to become masculine. So for example, um, if Kyle and I were shoveling snow together, Kyle could do it longer. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> well, in theory, you know, just like a generalized reading. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, yes, so to, yes, it, this, this whole question about um, strength is an interesting one because there are just assumptions about it. Um, and every now and again, you know, it, it's a general, it's a generality every now and again, you know, there are exceptions and uh, yeah, but, but in, in general, that's the understanding of, of that verb, um, that, uh, men are stronger and then to, to play the man is something a woman can do, but, um, but, uh, it's, it's not the natural state. Yeah. So Thomas at least a, a simple reading of that would be, yeah. I, I does, that, does that go at all to the idea of gender being a being constructed as opposed to biological? Yes, because if she does, if, you, if she plays the man, and Rizzo, if she plays the man, if she becomes strong and she thinks logically and, you know, whatever the, whatever the notion is, then yes, she could take on the performance as, as some women do in a masculine context and it's interesting Kyle because this is the resurrection context in which Mary is primarily it's, it's where we encounter her primarily so the proclamation itself it okay there are more women in Luke and they do speak but um, cumulatively um, there is no emancipatory movement here I, um, uh, yeah I think I think I think we could say that um, when the women's Bible commentary first came out, Jane Scharberg, now of blessed memory, wrote the essay on the Gospel of Luke. And she began it with a, a subtitle in a little square box, the Gospel of Luke is dangerous to your health. You know, it was this anti-smoking warning on cigarettes. <laughs> I thought it was quite funny at the time. Should we expect anything else? <laughs> what, what do you mean? Well, should we... Uh... Should we be looking for emancipatory language in Luke? Well, I mean, is, is it reasonable to think it would be there? Well, Kyle's read the Holy Spirit article. I mean, that's, and if you want to speak to that, Kyle. Because the, um, the Spirit, you know, the Spirit is accessible universally. Right. Right. So if you have a, in, if Luke Acts has a developed notion of pneumatology, then it's in theory possible that as the Joel the prophet says way back in Hebrew scripture, um, the spirit pours itself out on your sons and daughters and your young men will speak and uh, young women will speak as well. So the spirit is non-discriminatory. So if Luke has pneumatology, then you'd think, yes, this actually would, would be possible, but but then it seems as if, if I can just apply this one example, then even in regard to the spirit outpouring itself on people in Pentecost, as it will do in Acts, or, you know, at the birth of Jesus, where the Holy Spirit has overshadowed Mary and the spirit is in the words of the Simeon and Anna in the temple, it seems as if the Holy Spirit in Luke is constrained, is constrained by various factors. Um, we don't get Hannah's song, 
we, you know, we get Simeon's song, but we don't get Hannah's. Anna's, I should say Anna. Um, uh, the, 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 in Acts, Luke describes the four daughters of Philip who have a spirit of prophecy, and he locates them somewhere in Asia Minor. And he mentions them in passing as if we all know about them, which is interesting and good. And then we never hear from them again, and we never know. Of course, you could say, well, Luke isn't trying to give us the history of everything, but he is giving us a foundation epic. Whatever we think of Acts, Acts is, a, is an attempt to be some kind of epic story about the beginning of the Jerusalem community in the aftermath of the crucifixion. There's nothing else like it. So if you're creating a founding story uh, in an epic sense, then you'd, you'd kind of want something comprehensive, I think. So it's, it's an interesting series of gaps that we find, we seem to find in Luke. Um, can I go off on a little tangent? I'm interested in the Botswana um, study of masculinity, looking at Luke and Botswana men about whom I know zip. Uh, but I'm really interested to know what you picked up with regard to Jesus and the construction of masculinity. If you found that something that we could just reflect on for a minute. In Luke. He seems to have a much more mature masculinity. Yes. And this gets at some things that you wrote too. Uh, so could you unpack masculine, um, mature? Well, um, I, I, maybe it goes back to what I was trying to say before about um, the character coming into um, these same stories that might otherwise, as it did in the Botswana, um, saying lead to domination rather than cooperation or... Right. Um, right. 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 And I, I think this is, this is the point that the author, whose name I've temporarily forgotten, uh, is, 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 is implying, is stating. So, for example, he would say something like, um, the way Jesus takes women seriously. So he heals a bent over woman, for example, we have in the story of the woman who was bent over in the Gospel of Luke. Um, uh, he, shall we say, to use uh, Bob's language about maturity, he doesn't find himself diminished when talking to people of a lower status because the norm is honor. Honor is the structure of the world of Jesus' time, and it's the structure of the Asian world of our time, too. You must save face at all costs. You must learn how to help people save face in all kinds of situations. So, so Jesus' honor doesn't diminish when talking to women. I, f I, find that, I find that useful. And I was thinking myself of some other examples um, on the cross in Luke's gospel. Jesus, at the point of death, is able to speak to somebody who is, has no status at all, the thief or the robber. The... Um, um Samaritan woman that, I mean, Jesus doesn't treat her very well, but it's not because she's a woman, I don't think, it's because she's a Samaritan. Um, yeah. And he prefers the, um, his own Hebrew people over, over them, but then he, even then he changes, changes his mind. Right. I'm so glad you brought that up, Bob, because... Um that story is only in Matthew and Mark's gospel. Right. So it's, it's a great example of how a story that seems to indicate the parity of status between Jesus and an interrogatory woman 
is actually not in the Lucan text where we were trying to locate th these kinds of discussions. And it, it's, it's kind of a surprising gap. It's a kind of a surprising gap. But, but I agree with you, it's a, it's a further example of this. Only it becomes more exceptional in Matthew and Mark where we right. have a right. context. We don't have Luke 8 where several women who follow Jesus are named and some of them look pretty well off because they provided for him after, uh, out of their resources and so on. So, yeah, so that's the kind of story that we, we, we think really would be good if it were there. The hemorrhaging woman would also be a great example of this, right? So a woman who's hemorrhaging would be considered exactly. ghastly. Exactly. And so Jesus doesn't rebuke her for touching him, he exactly. says. Exactly. Your faith makes you well. So exactly. in, a, in a group of people, too. So that, that sort of speaks to that dynamic of how he yeah. uh, isn't diminished by speaking to people of that status. Yeah, exactly. And, and I would say the level of conversation that he has with women as well. I mean, when we're looking at the uh, Syrophoenician woman as an example, yeah. And um, and they're sparring back and forth yeah. uh, pretty well. Yes. And um, you really don't do that unless you're taking the other person seriously. Yes. Uh, to a certain extent. Yes. Uh, Absolutely. Um, yes. The, the the gospel for this week, um, the woman at the well, which Darlene was mentioning at the beginning, which comes up in John's gospel. That's a good example about back and forth, you know, and a real exchange such that the understanding of both changes and then she goes off and you know preaches to the samaritans and they come and look at you i mean it's very uh, that 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 is another story that doesn't come up in luke's gospel too it's 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 really interesting what did luke make of the origin origins of samaria what did he make of the origins of samaria it's kind of it kind of interesting so so yeah there is a, there is a fair amount of evidence here. There's there's something also that I want to get at, and we'll pick it up on another discussion. I just want to allude to it here. There's something about Luke's portrait of Jesus, especially on the cross, and especially under duress in the Garden of Gethsemane, which shows Jesus in complete control of a deteriorating situation. So for example, if you take just the episode I referred to a moment ago, Jesus from the cross continues the kind of thing he did in his life, namely talk to people who might be thought to have no honor at all. And to do that, he has to be in control in a situation where he would be in extreme pain. So now here, what we get, in addition to this, this performance of gender, is we get this performance of self-control. And that has to do with gender as well. Uh, a man in the ancient world does not become irrational. An irrational man is a contradiction in the ancient world. I mean, of course, it's, you know, it's perfectly possible to get that. But, but the, the normal man is somebody who does not acknowledge suffering, does not acknowledge extreme duress. And this is how Luke portrays Jesus. So there's a nice overlap here between both gender and philosophical social norms. Remember on the cross in Matthew and Mark, Jesus is either not crucified with other people and says, a string of words, which we call the seven last words. They're not seven in Greek, but, and those seven last words are words that indicate someone who is in acute distress. I don't see how else you say it, unless you say something like, well, it's really a quote from the Psalms. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I want to pick this up later, but I just want to, I want to flag it here. Okay, good. So now let me uh, ask about the Moodle picture of Jesus, because we were talking about Jesus. I didn't give it a caption um, for this weekend. Kyle, you may not have looked at it. But um, if you had a chance to look at it, that is supposed to be a reconstruction of what Jesus looked like. Um, if you Google it, you'll see that it was done in 2015 on the basis of some socio-empiric studies. What did you make of the face when you looked at the face? Did you, did you have any reaction? 
I, I actually watched that doc. There's like a brief documentary oh, about it. Great. Um, it is very, very interesting. Um, I, I like seeing uh, a Jesus who, will, who looks a little more like what he is supposed to look like. Right. Um, right. So, right. so uh, I, love, I love that image, whether or not that's really exactly what uh, right. he looked like. But. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I'm glad you watched it because I, I haven't seen that. So I, I may have missed some good details and so on. But, but they had reliable scientists explaining it probably. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. It was. It was a bit more entertaining than I thought it would be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I. I don't. Yeah. But it was. It was interesting. I forget how they constructed. What yeah. they, did they use the shroud of Turin or something like that? Is that? I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 But that that image, um, even if it's reconstructed, that definitely looks like um, a, a figure from, uh, from a non-Western country. Oh, yeah. Yes, which, which is, is, is it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing, it's a good thing. So, and it doesn't have long hair, it doesn't have long hair. I mean, a lot of the pictures of Jesus in a kind of, um, uh, in, a, in a gender bending kind of a way, have him look like Darlene's hair. You know, the wrong kind of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like a hippie. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. I, I'm struck by the expression. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, it in so many um, uh, uh, representations of Jesus, we either see the very serene Jesus. Uh, uh, with the long flowing uh, robes and the um, and the light from above and things of that nature, uh, or uh, in the, but this we actually I I don't know quite how to describe the, uh, uh, the expression. It's one of it's sort of wonderment. It is. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's almost questioning in a way. Uh, there's a little bit of a furrowed brow yep. uh, that uh, that's happening there. It's, um, it makes him appear much more human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Kyle, did they say anything about the expression that you recall? No, not that I recall at all, no. But because it is interesting, it kind of, I don't know. I mean, how much can we attribute to facial expressions? How much meaning can we attribute to facial expressions? I find a it... Lot. Uh, well, uh, yes, but what do we know about different cultures and facial expressions? I mean, I can see your face and you can see mine and I can, you know, I know you a little bit so I can have a hazard a guess as to um, what you might be thinking. But, but for 2000 years ago, different ethnic background, yeah, puzzling. I think the purpose, they didn't focus much on, on expression. It was more the purpose of um, constructing a face that looked non-Western. And, and, and so you see that. Um, and I also think, it, I mean, there's no way they could tell from the forensic science, I don't think, um, but his hair is kind of unkempt and wild yeah. in this image, yeah. which, which is interesting. Like it, it, it's an interesting, uh, in comparison to what the long flowing, beautiful yeah. uh, <laughs> hair that he has. That <laughs> Perfectly cloth. That's a wander into the <laughs> desert, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's interesting to even think about our need to know what Jesus looked like. Mm -hmm. As though it makes a difference. I'm always struck by when I come across an image of Jesus, um, an Asian Jesus. Um, yeah. And so you're right, Bob. I'm really interested in that. I think that for me, I always think about the universality of Christ and right. how we always see ourselves in Christ, which is a good thing, and Christ in us. Um, but I do like seeing images like this too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I suppose it would be true to say that on the scale of more masculine or less masculine in the ancient world, we would have to say that Jesus came across as less masculine.
Can I disagree with that? Please do. Please do. <laughs> Please, please. I, I think he is. He presents a more ideal masculinity rather than a um, maybe a stereotypical one. And what would be the traits of that? I'm I'm glad you said that. What would be the traits of that? The ideal form. Uh, benevolence and and um, accept accepting and maturity and uh, intelligence and um what do you call a seagull that right. flies over the bay a bagel <laughs> i'm afraid that was an interruption by alexa <laughs> do any of you know alexa Telling bells. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why Alexa came in the middle of Bob's speech, but uh, but apparently Alexa heard something that Bob said. <laughs> oh, so, so okay, so Bob, um, the ideal form. Uh, yeah, a more mature manifestation. I mean, you think of some of the um, images of people who preceded Jesus, like um, Abraham or Noah or um, David or um, the prophets, and and they're all kind of approximations of what Jesus takes to the full limit. I think I think that's what we I think now that's what we hope masculinity is um, but I don't know that in the audience of the Gospels that would be the same perception am I incorrect that, I would agree that, with that but it did, I mean this is kind of what I get hung up on sometimes is that we we look at scripture through our own filters of 21st century, what's right and wrong and what we think ought to be, uh, rather than zeroing in on a first century context and what things were like then and what it was like to be male then and seeing it in that context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But if I think, if I'm incorrect, and please correct me, uh, Deirdre, if, Bob, if, if that's what we're doing, and we look at Jesus from a first century perspective, he isn't necessarily as masculine as those other characters. Is that, is that the point you're trying to make? Perhaps I'm... Because... If you're, because I believe what you're saying is he is the ideal masculine form, but in first century, I don't know that that's necessarily true. Uh, no, and that's why, probably why he was, why he was executed, uh, or at least one of the reasons that um, he he was a a, uh, a radical um, nonconformist in a sense, but still pointed the way to a different way of, of, of being. But I don't, I don't know that in doing that, it just detracts from his masculinity. Well, we don't see Jesus going out and working the uh, fishing nets and all, you know, doing hard labor. Although his father was a carpenter, he probably did carpentry. But he's he's just kind of I won't I don't want to use the word effeminate, but he's always preaching and teaching and doing things that the other men don't do. Uh, you know, he doesn't seem to. If you look at pictures of him, he's not um, your ideal masculine type. You know, he's not flexing his muscles and spouting off his mouth or whatever um or <laughs> my husband just walked by so i'm not saying <laughs> 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 
that's between us. <laughs> You're right. I mean, he does, he's not out there fishing. I, I, maybe he doesn't fish. I, I've always thought that maybe he just doesn't. Maybe, maybe he, he's one of those people who, who is, he's, he doesn't do sports. <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, there are men in antiquity who don't do sports. <laughs> That's why I always thought it was strange that you have all these fishermen guys out in the boat during a storm. And yep. they turn to Jesus, who happens to be asleep, exactly. asking for advice as to what they're supposed to do. Exactly. 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 Well, well, um, I, you know, I, I see that um, I see that more in bringing him into closer alignment uh, with the scribes and the Pharisees, whose lives would have been similar. That uh, uh, that specifically, um, you know, Jesus speaks with scriptural authority, yeah. just like the scribes and the Pharisees yeah. reportedly do, and uh, and I think that in my mind that puts me on parallel with the types of um, uh, approaches that they might have. Uh, right, and the key, they call him rabbi, so he has this authority with the books, with the tradition, with the oral tradition, and so on. So that's right. Um, and in Luke, he does hang out at least once with the people in the temple, the erudite leaders in the temple. So, yeah, there, there is. Yeah, and it strangely puts him in a position kind of equal to those who don't do manual labor. It does. Even so, he's an itinerant, you know, um, almost right. a vagrant. Yeah. yeah. Um, but still, he, he's not doing mainly work like scribes and Pharisees and um, um, much higher class people. Right. Um, Who hang out around the temple, for example. I mean, he, it, yeah. he, he doesn't hang out around the temple. He goes somewhere else. So he's, he's definitely got a distinctive ministry. Absolutely. But you're right. I mean, he does quote scripture and he can refer to oral and written traditions in Hebrew scripture. So. So isn't this a beautiful uh, portrait of, of, of Jesus that we have, though, that in some ways we do see this masculinity that that is typical, and we see this person who is not typical, as in there are a list of women who take care of him in yeah. the Gospel of Luke, yeah. Yeah. right? So so he doesn't work, right? He has no means, and, some, and hey, here are these ladies' uh, names who took yeah. care of him. Yeah. So it's kind of a beautiful balance. Um, of yeah. how Jesus is this incredibly different character. Right, and he's not married to any one of them. No. And they don't seem to be married people when they're around him. I mean, they're married, you know, the women are married, but their husbands are somewhere else. Because it's, it, the whole thing is really, it's, it's really distinctive. It's very, it's very interesting, which is what Bob is talking about with regard to, as I understand what Bob is saying, an ideal. An ideal, a mature, Bob. This is your language, right? This is right. Not mature. Yeah, exactly. You know, I I just have to confess that in the back of my mind is our political situation, which is the absolute antithesis of all of this. I'll just say that, and I'll leave it there. And we'll go <laughs> because Bob, and then I will stop. Um, what I and maybe the rest of us like you take for granted now in our present environment can no longer be taken for granted. That's, 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 the, that's the interesting thing. You know, a year ago we could have had this discussion and it would be consonant with, with, with our political situation. And now we can, we can no longer do that. So it, it raises questions about how you stabilize discussions like these. I think I'm distressing somebody's cat. Um, that's mine. <laughs> rather talk it now for some reason. <laughs> we have Not unusual. He always has something to say. <laughs> so, um, so the itinerant ministry that Jesus has, um, just to try and um, summarize it, involves a journey in Luke. We're going to see this very soon. It, it's a journey that Luke sets up in the middle of the gospel, and this is a journey to Jerusalem. Now, along on this journey, there's all kinds of scholarly activities going on. Yes, there's itinerant ministry, and people are going from place to place, and mostly city to city, 
not so much village to village. But we've got this wonderful story about Mary and Martha right in Luke 10, after the journey to Jerusalem has begun, which is all about how are we studying as women? How are we working with the traditional roles of women? How do we balance these demands as we move along the way? Are we going to sit at the feet of Jesus? What's going to, who is Jesus? What does he have in mind? So, I mean, I think these discussions are part of what Luke is actually representing in the story of Mary and Martha. So all I'm doing is putting that story in the context of itinerant ministry, which is not the way it's usually understood. It's usually understood to be something about, you know, who's doing what in the house and so on. So, yeah. Isn't that also a more of a theological discussion? That the, have, that, uh, that the, the story presents a theological discussion. So Mary and Martha, yes. Yes, yes. Um, yes, it, it's an enigmatic discussion because when Jesus says one thing only is needful, it's not quite clear exactly to what he's referring. So it's not a discussion like the woman at the well where you feel like some resolution has been achieved. It's a kind of discussion that, that seems to favor Mary's activity at Jesus' feet. But in the 2,000 years of Christian tradition, everybody rushes around trying to um, balance Martha, you know, <laughs> sort of, you know um, say active and contemplative are both legitimate uh, attitudes to Jesus. So it is a theological discussion, but, but the journey goes on pretty soon, immediately. Um, the Good Samaritan in chapter 10. Here's another example about the masculinity of Jesus. This is, not the sum, this is not the total point of the story, but it's very interesting that an injured person, an injured person would be regarded as dishonorable. You know, they had brought it on themselves in some way, right? And yet here's Jesus who portrays someone as being compassionate, or as Martin Luther King Jr. would say, altruistic, Dangerous altruism that crosses over the side. So this is another. This is another example how the journey the the journey begins to work out different responses to gender, and the journey will end in the cross, where we'll where we'll see where we'll see Jesus subject to dis, the greatest dishonor. Okay, well, um, we've managed to record this so far, so I'm going to stop in a, in a moment. But I just want to say that I haven't yet written down what we will do uh, as something that is your project for the class. Last, last semester we did simple, I hope there were reasonably simple projects and so on. I think, unless you object, we'll do something similar. But I must put that down onto the, onto the uh, course because I haven't, I haven't done that yet. So would that be, would that be acceptable? So for, example, for example, you could, you could, you could, following along just today's discussion as an example, you could, take, you could take the passage of Mary and Martha or the passage about the Good Samaritan or something like this and look at it any way you want to. You could, you could do an exegesis with regard to um, location in the Gospels, context. You could do it with regard to gender criticism or something like this. So would that be reasonable? Sure. Not, not, too, not too much to give you to do. Because I know that you're taking other courses simultaneously. <laughs> Is that true? That's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And they have other assignments and so on. So I don't, I don't want to clash with them. And, um, but I, I, want to, I want to put something on the Moodle so that you will have an idea 
that you'll be able to anticipate before we get to the end of the semester. Okay, now um, for next week, um, we want to try and get all on the same page. So if we could agree that, at least from last week, if you could look at instances of the Holy Spirit, the pneumatology of Luke Acts, that would be very good. Um, so for example, um, both Luke and Acts begin the gospel and the Acts of the Apostles with a great pour outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So at the beginning of Acts, you have the gift of the Spirit at Pentecost. This enables, this enables, um, this enables people to speak in other languages than the ones with which they are familiar. Uh, so to the birth, Luke and birth narratives, we were looking at them last week, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is evident in the conception of Jesus in the case of Mary and the conception of John in the case of Elizabeth and the outpouring of the Spirit in the voices of Simeon and Anna and Zachariah and so on and so on. So, so um, if, if you can see uh, these kinds of patterns in the whole of Luke Acts by way of Luke's interest in the notion of the Holy Spirit, then that would be very good. And um, I, I'm not sure if the essay makes it clear, but the whole notion of the Spirit uh, is com comes right out of Hebrew scriptures. And it's given a particular uh, focus in Luke Acts, but the Spirit hovers over the water at creation from Genesis uh, 1 onwards. The Spirit is there in the um, anointing of Hebrew prophets. Every prophet um, is anointed, uh, every king is anointed by a prophet in Israelite tradition. You, you know this from your work in Hebrew scriptures. So this is taking on the idea of the Spirit and the functions of Spirit in prophecy, in the presence of God, um, uh, the, the wind over the water in creation, so this is Luke's understanding of the Spirit. And it will be very different from, for example, John's understanding of the Spirit. Um, we haven't really looked much at the Gospel of John, but John's understanding of the Spirit is that of Paraclete. In John 14, 15, and 16, the Spirit is the counselor or advocate. This puts the Spirit into a legal setting. The Spirit then, in John's Gospel, will cause you, the followers of Jesus, to remember all things. The Spirit will lead you into all truth. So this is, this is, this is the different emphasis of the Spirit in, in John's Gospel. But I, I want you to get a sense of what's particular to Spirit in Luke. And if you can connect it with Hebrew scriptures and connect it with prophecy and connect it with um, manifestations of divine favor in Luke Acts, then that will be a good way to begin to think about it. Now, having done that, then we will all be on the same page. And um, I will make a note of this and I will uh, send it with um, this file, which was being recorded and it'll get to Stacy with any luck, whose power will be restored soon. So, yeah, we're missing Ridge and Kurt also. Yes, we're missing Kurt too. So I'll be able to send this to Kurt as well. So, so that'll, that'll, be, that'll be very useful. Okay, are we good? Yes. Great, any, any, any other thoughts you have? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the chat. Thank Thanks you. for the discussion. And I will see you next week. All being well. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.